Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with an organ entrepreneurial legend. Yeah, I'm, that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say legend. I think everybody in the organ entrepreneurial ecosystem knows this individual, has come across this individual. I'm very fortunate for this individual to be on my show. Amanda Oborn, how are you doing? I am great, and I'm very flattered. I think that is not true, but I will. I'm going to take that legend title to the bank. <laughs> so, before we get into legendary speak, let's give introduce the world. Who is Amanda? Oh my gosh! Well, I have been in Portland since about 2006. I think we met most recently when I was at the executive director of the Oregon Entrepreneurs Network, which is really where I cut my teeth in getting to know the entrepreneurial community here. Incredible, amazing ecosystem that it is. Um, and most recently just joined Ideaship, which is the venture arm of a patent asset house, which we can talk more about, but focused on startup venture funding for companies that are creating novel intellectual property. So can be a little geeky, a little fascinating. It's the world being created before it's <laughs> launched into the public view and and super interesting actually. So I'm excited that you're you're interested in it. No, it's super, super innovative. I really like uh, innovation and kind of getting like grassroots efforts, like seeing what's happening before it even happens kind of thing. And I feel like that's the world you're currently in right now. Now, before we get into that, I would love to kind of hear your backstory, how did you kind of get into the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in the Oregon area? And you know, what have you done before this uh, new venture? Oh my gosh, such a long and winding road. Um, I grew up in the Intermountain West. My dad's from Northern Montana. My mom's from Southern Oregon. My dad was on the faculty at Utah State University. So I grew up in a small town in Northern Utah of about 20,000 people. And my mom had two sisters who lived in Portland and grand my grandparents lived in Southern Oregon and out on the coast. So every year I would come to Oregon and spend a lot of time here. I sort of remember old Oregon, even though I didn't live here full time myself until 06. Um, but when I was in the fifth grade, my family moved. My dad took a project on the East Coast and we moved to Philadelphia for three years. And it was such an eye opener coming from a small rural kind of Western Midwestern town. Um, the diversity of people, the diversity of thought, just the ideas and, and the way people interacted with each other was, it was like, I felt like I'd been dropped into another world, really. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then the pro well, I have to tell you the story of moving out there. Um, we had a suburban, my family had a suburban. And so my mom, my dad, and my brother and I all loaded up the suburban to drive cross country um, on my birthday, actually, my ninth birthday. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, we had a dog and a cat, a Dalmatian dog who had just had puppies. So it was mom, dad, brother, sister, dog, cat. And I think it was like a half a dozen little teeny tiny oh, wow. like six or eight week old puppies all in the suburban driving across country with half of our worldly belongings, you know, on the roof rack. I, I joked that I felt like we were the Clampets driving into downtown <laughs> Philadelphia with all the, the skyscrapers and the city and that super urban vibe that I had never seen in person before. And my mouth was just hanging open and staring up at those skyscrapers and wondering what planet I dropped into because I'd just never seen anything like it before. But I loved it out there and spent about three years there. My dad finished up his project and we moved back to Logan. <laughs> and so there I was back in high school, back in Logan, feeling like the world had suddenly gotten really small again. And I knew I wanted to go for college somewhere else and um, ended up going to Washington University in St. Louis. So as much as I thought I might go back to the East Coast or, or to Oregon, I ended up in St. Louis for four years. Had a great experience there, lived in Europe for a while, traveled in Europe after college for quite a while, and then eventually landed in San Francisco and worked for a digital marketing agency, although it wasn't known as digital back then. The world was still pretty <laughs> analog at that time. Um, but I was working in databases and like doing statistics and anticipating um customer uh, relationship campaigns for big brands like Levi's at the time, 
got really into the data-driven marketing world, and the president of that agency prompted me to go to grad school. And there was one program in the country that was really, really doing in-depth work in that kind of data-driven marketing, and it was in Chicago. So I went to Northwestern for grad school. And when I finished there, then I joined the team of direct marketers at Intuit, working on the QuickBooks brand. So the first 15 years of my career really was all in marketing-related stuff. And then, like I say, in 2006, I moved to Portland and took a job as the executive director of a little trade association in the fitness industry. But mostly I was being a mom. I had two babies at that point. So I was working from home, but I got really interested. It was about that time that I read a book called The Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan, which really pulled the veil down um, about what the way the food system in the US works and globally actually totally blew my mind. I had no idea um, that that's the way the food system worked. And my parents at that time, my dad had graduated, or graduated, listen to me. My dad had retired. <laughs> From university life, a little on the early side, my parents had bought land in Central Oregon, and they were opening a 100% grass-finished buffalo ranch on 120 acres. Nice. In so at the same time, they were starting their journey in small animal agriculture, sustainable agriculture. I had just read this book about food systems and become kind of irate at the way the food system operates, the ag system operates in this country. And started doing some volunteer work for friends of family farmers and other local nonprofits working in sustainable ag, which is how I came across the opportunity to join Ecotrust, the nonprofit Ecotrust, which is based here in Portland, but does work from Northern California up through Alaska in lots of natural resource sectors, including the food system. So in 2010, I took the job as a sales marketing director for Food Hub, which was their online platform. So it was an innovation that they had created. It's an online platform to connect farmers and ranchers and fishermen directly with food service operators and restaurateurs and um, like school food service and that kind of stuff. And I won't go into all the details, but I basically spent the next 10 years doing food system reform work and launched the Red on Salmon Street, that two oh, yeah. block campus on the central east side, which is where we met. At that is, Canada. yes, it was. So that was a project of ours and we launched an Ag of the Middle Accelerator and just, just did and published a big report on food system infrastructure and just really went deep into food system work. But there was a lot going on, you know, a lot of things changing, including the leadership at Ecotrust. And so I was approached by um, a local venture capitalist that I think a lot of people in the community know. And, and we went on a walk and talk, actually just talking mostly about food system. He was getting into some food food investing. And by the end of it, he said, you know, I'm on the selection committee for the Oregon Entrepreneurs Network executive director, and I think you should maybe apply. <laughs> and so I went through the application and interview process. And lo and behold, November 2019, I joined OEM <laughs> right before COVID hit and sort of turned the world upside down. Um, but yeah, that was an incredible experience. And that's, that's really how I got to know the, the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Oregon. And and sort of jumped in with both feet, really. Yeah. Now, and then now you've kind of you're you're not necessarily pivoting, but you're moving on to a different venture, right? In in the InfoShip Fund. So let's talk about that. What or the IdeaShip Fund? What what is IdeaShip Fund, and what does it aim to do? Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've kind of gone in, right into the belly of the beast by jumping across the table and sitting on the same side with other venture capitalists in town. It's a it's a venture fund. It's um, wholly owned by GTT Group, Global Tech Transfer Group, which is a big patent equity or patent asset firm. So they do um, brokerage and um, asset valuations and consulting and strategy for multinational corporations and their patent portfolios. And the founder, Michael Lubitz, had a long history also doing startups. He'd been involved in like 15 different startups. And so partly out of just his own soft spot for wanting to support the founder inventor through the startup journey, and partly from all the GTT work and seeing what happens when a patent foundation isn't properly laid and what the ramifications of that can be. Um, Michael had this notion along with a partner at Panasonic Intellectual Property Corporation of America, which was a partner of GTT's. Um, they together launched this fund in in 2018, I think was the first fund. 
So they've made 70 investments now across two funds, and I came on board to help deploy the third. Um, Ideaship has a unique model. It's a um, patent equity fund. So what that means is we identify young startup companies that look like you know they're doing something novel and interesting and solving a real problem and have a great team and look like a good investment in all the ways that any venture fund would evaluate a good investment. But then we have this added layer of understanding what novelty, what innovation they're really developing and how they um, might capitalize on that intellectual property. And we will help them, we make an investment in the company, but instead of that investment coming in as operating capital, it gets deployed in service to building the intellectual property foundation of the company. So we help them document all their novelties. We work with whoever their patent counsel is to get their first patent filed. We develop a patent strategy roadmap for them, a patent market um, analysis, and in the end, a, a valuation of the patent itself all of which, all those materials really help them at each successive stage of fundraising, get a better valuation and ultimately a better exit. So that's what we exist to do is help startups with their patent work. Um, and we get exposed to a lot of really fascinating innovations as a result. And why would you like, you know, I think this is very interesting because I don't, I don't think I've ever had anybody on here that really focused on that kind of line of work. But why, I think it's important to also explain this to the listeners, why is getting a patent and like in copyright and trademark, why are those things so important for an entrepreneur? Yeah, well, it's one of the first things that an equity investor down the road is going to look for. There's, they always have a checklist of, um, you know, the things that they want to see a company have in order to be really venture backable and fundable. They're going to look for the experience of the team. They're going to look for product market fit. They're going to look for traction. They're going to look for, uh, you know, these other indicators that the company is going to be a good investment ultimately. And one of those items is, are they developing something new and novel and have they protected it in such a way that they can really own the business behind their business? So it, it protects them from competitive threat to a certain degree. It keeps... Um, the company from having other competitors just copy what they're doing, especially larger competitors. In fact, if you write your patents properly, then you actually want them to be written broadly in such a way that a big, you know, big corporation might feel like they need to buy the company or make a play to buy the company because this patent is so valuable and they may already be infringing on it. And so they need to buy the company in order to stay in compliance themselves and reduce their own, um, you know, risk mitigation. So that's what you, that's kind of the ideal world is, is, and that's what makes ideaship unique um, is that the, the strategy that goes on in the thinking for how to build the IP platform is really designed to help the company capitalize on that IP as they go through successive rounds of funding. That's really what drives the whole, the, the model that we're developing. And you know, folks, I hope you're listening because you just got like some real free knowledge dropped on you right there. I mean, <laughs> honestly, thinking about creating a patent, but in a broad sense makes so much sense when you're thinking of scaling and selling, right? Because again, you're talking about intellectual property. So folks for intellectual property, these are your thoughts and ideas, right? You want to be able to protect these thoughts and ideas and you want to be able to monetize um, some type or create some type of monetization off of it, not somebody else, right? And, and this is just a form of protecting it. And there's a lot of people who think of getting a patent, particularly in the context of startup investing, as really like it's just a box they need to check, right? You need to have a patent. You need to be able to say you have a patent. There are a lot of patents that aren't worth very much, though, if, if they're not written well, and they don't really do anything to add value to the company over time. So the, I'm only, I've only been with Ideaship for a few months. I'm only just coming to understand this myself. I always thought it was a matter of like, yeah, you build your moat, right? And then, and then people can't access your, you know, you have a, you, you're legally protected. You yeah. can see them if they, if they try to use your innovations or whatever. And it's so much more complex than that underneath the hood, which is why having, you know, a team of folks at your 
on your cap table and on your bench really of advisors who can um who have that experience that you know a lifetime's michael in this case has been eating patents for breakfast since he was a kid because his father and his family were patent litigators so anyway it's just a, it's it's a it's a much more advanced and sophisticated level of understanding around what a patent can do for a company than than certainly i understood just from being an outsider in the yeah. entrepreneurial ecosystem looking in you know i know you've kind of only been in the 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 patent world um in this new new role kind of a short time but what would you say i'm not sure maybe would you know some ideas of when it's the right time to go for a patent and when it's not the right time. So maybe an entrepreneur is listening and they think, you know what, maybe I should be going for that. When is the right time to move forward? And maybe when's the time to maybe, you know what, that's not, it's not yet. Yeah. Well, you know what, before I answer that question, it might be helpful to talk a little bit about when a utility patent even makes sense, sort of what industries, because perfect. in a lot of cases, um, a patent doesn't matter all that much if you're in software or enterprise SaaS or you're doing an AI ML kind of um, solution. Because if you're in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and you want to file a patent, then you're probably going to have to expose the whole algorithm that's dry. It's sort of your secret sauce is going to get um made transparent in your patent application, which might not be what you want. You might want to use trade secret law instead to protect that kind of an idea. And if you're, there are other places where copyright might be important or um, trademark might be important. So first, just to clarify what IdeaShip's focused on are utility patents. So the industries that that tends to take us into are um, deep tech, clean tech, climate tech, hardware, medical device, um, anything where there's there's sort of, you think of like the, oil, you have a picture of Einstein or some old school inventor in your mind, you know, something where there's something physical. So unlike a lot of local venture funds who are not that interested in hardware or that kind of thing, then that's someplace that IdeaShip spends a lot of time because that's where there's a lot of patentability. Um, so yeah, those tend to be the sectors. And if you're in one of those sectors, we can add the most value very, very early in the process. So you have to be kind of beyond concept. You want to, you know, you need to have a, there needs to be a there there in terms of a business. We look for companies that have registered as Delaware C Corps and, and have some level of investment already. And we do look at companies that might be, um, you know, funded through SBIR grants or other non-dilutive means. Um, or they might have some angel investment, but they're definitely on their way to, to getting their first institutional or financial investor. The reason for that is that as a strategic investor where we're our, our investment is coming in the form of patent services, the company needs to have operating capital to scale, right? So right, it doesn't right. do any good to have a really hot shot patent, something, something special, but if you don't have the money to build the business around it. So we look for companies that that have some level of institutional investment they've got a team they've you know they're building out a prototype and they've they're you know they're making some headway but they're they may or may not be selling a product yet because there's a there are a bunch of time clocks to keep in mind when you think about patents so if you started selling the product already you're on a really short <laughs> time frame to get it patented. Most people are looking, thinking about patents before they get to the point of sales, but you really have to be careful about any kind of public disclosures. Um, so keep it stealth until you've got your patent strategy underway. Um, so we work with companies that may or may not have filed a provisional patent, which is basically just sets the, um, the timing. So the in, in the US, the first company to file on a particular innovation is the company that wins the patent. I mean, not that they necessarily get a patent every time, but if there's a competition, so to speak, between if several people are working on an innovation, whoever, it doesn't matter who thought of the idea first or who did research first, whoever files first is the one that will have the best chance at getting that patent. So best to get a provisional in early so that you have that early date. And then you have up to a year after filing a provisional patent to get the full patent application in. And oh, by the way, then it can take like two or three or four or five years to actually get a patent granted. So it's it's a long process. Um, 
but yeah, that's, does that give you kind of the yes. orientation? No, and this is, this is, perfect. <laughs> this is perfect because I think, um, I, I literally just had a conversation earlier this week. I'm going to connect you with some of our folks from the biomedical entrepreneurship program at OHSU. Uh, the reason for this is because we're starting to look at how do we help a lot of our providers in your point that create these new devices because they're they're in the healthcare space uh, or or sometime in the pharmaceutical space. How do we help commercialize what they're doing? Um, and these are individuals that are working with the SBIR grants. And so for those folks that may be un uh, unfamiliar, SBIR is a small business innovation research program, and they kind of help uh, fund some of these innovative uh, ideas and thoughts. And I think, you know, to your point, Amanda, I think one one of the things our entrepreneurs, especially in the healthcare world, they know healthcare, right? That, that's their focus. They are not intuitive and they're not really focused on the, they didn't really go to school for the patent world. Right. But that's your area of expertise, right? Where, where I think you can kind of really help bridge the gap in a lot of ways and help individuals understand this is what's needed to get to that next level because, uh, Healthcare space, I think it's it's imperative that um, nonprofit healthcare institutions begin to look at ways to kind of help support and commercialize the some of the thoughts and ideas that are actually coming out of their location. Because as you said, if they don't, somebody else will, uh, and it tends to be a private device company. And again, the funds for these nonprofit hospitals goes back into the community and helps support the uh, you know the healthcare mission. Now, how about how? Let's talk about the Portland ecosystem because this is you you work a lot in the Portland ecosystem. Um, how how one holistically, how how big is this entrepreneur ecosystem that you were working with? And then what are some of the things that you've done, some of the most prouder moments that you've said, like, hey, you may have heard of this company, or maybe even didn't hear about this company, but this is a pretty a pretty proud moment in the Amanda kind of <laughs> world of entrepreneurship. Well, uh, first of all, um, we just you just spoke recently with one of the portfolio companies that I invested in while here at IdeaShip, Marcelino Alvarez and the team over at Photon Marine. That's definitely one of the proud moments for me. I think Marcelino is a great founder. Um, we connected also at Pitch Latino with you and, and Marcelino. Um, really a great team. Charles Steinbeck, one of the co-founders, and I worked together at Ecotrust, so we knew each other from then. Um, but yeah, so I'm I'm very excited about the electric propulsion and everything that that um, Photon Marine is doing, at both an environmental level, at an innovative level, at a community engagement level. I mean, everything about what they're doing, I'm I'm super psyched about. So, and it's an awesome team. So I'm glad to be connected with them. Very proud of that investment. Um, another one that that harkens straight back to my food system reform days, the first investment I made at IdeaShip was in a, a local company called Canopy, which has developed a fully automated robotic greenhouse system, um, which I think of they are they are targeting farmers who want to supplement their supply year round and have fresh um, leafy greens and produce available year round and protected from all the variable weather, which we know is probably likely to get more and more variable as time goes on. Um, but I also think of them as potentially a really exciting food security play as well. I could imagine a mus municipality buying one of these green automated greenhouse systems that doesn't require labor or any particular technical knowledge and just spitting out leafy greens in a neighborhood that may not have great access to fresh produce. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting for food security ideas to come out of that business over time as they develop. So Canopy was an exciting one. But yet yeah, IdeaShip has invested in 70 companies and many of them, probably half, are in the Pacific Northwest. We do fund across the US. So any US-based company is eligible for investment with IdeaShip funds. Um, but yeah, the, the Pacific Northwest is our, our backyard and our home. So there's a lot of the research goes right into finding companies here. And, and what's, what is the plan in the backyard and the home for the next five, you know, 10 years? What's, what's the goal? For IdeaShip? Or are you talking, are you thinking more broadly about the entrepreneurial community here? Let's, let's first, let's go with IdeaShip and then let's go more broadly. Yeah, I mean, IdeaShip is, we're on fund three, I need to make four, I'm going to make 40 investments over the next 12 to 18 months. So I am hot on the trail of looking for founders 
innovating, you know, those founder inventors that are doing really creative things and, and have this, the chops to build a business around it and scale it. Um, so that's going to be my focus for the next year. And then I think there will be an idea ship fund four and fund five. So I think we'll continue to grow this model as, as we fine tune what works for founders. Um, so I'm excited about that. I think we're going to ride this economic wave that, that we're all kind of on the cusp of maybe, you know, that there's been a lot of talk about how unpredictable and variable the market sort of macro market forces are in investing right now. But, but I think our focus on early stage companies and innovation is, is going to be sort of evergreen throughout whatever those waves look like. I mean, if you think back to the 08, 09 financial crisis and all the incredible companies that emerged out of that time, early stage companies and innovative companies from Shopify to the iPad, you know, there's Airbnb. Just yeah, there's a bunch yeah. of them out of there. Yeah. So I think it's a great time for this investment thesis specifically. I think the next five years are going to be really, really exciting. And so I, I feel kind of lucky, honestly, that I happen to to jump into this role right at a time when, you know, out of these crucible moments come true innovation, necessity being the mother of innovation. And I think in climate and clean tech, that's going to be particularly true, especially with all the federal funding that's that's sort of rolling into that sector as well. So yeah. that's what the idea ship picture looks like. Um, I think that Portland's metro area is also having a crucible moment. I mean, this is not news, right? This every it's been on in the pages of the Portland Business Journal and lots of other media um, over the last several months and going back even a couple of years that companies are getting really frustrated, including a lot of the you know very successful OEN supported entrepreneurs. Um, you know, that on the, it was front page news recently that Revan Optics and Salt and Straw and, um, you know, a lot of companies are just getting, they're fed up um, with the lack of leadership and visionary creative kind of solutions for, for what Portland is dealing with right now. And I think it's incumbent on all of us and Stephen Green and Juan Barraza and a lot of local leaders have really made commitments to double down and stay here, stay committed to getting Portland through this time. And I count myself an idea ship in that group that that we're not going anywhere and we're here and we're funding locally and and part of the community and want to be a force for for seeing the Portland metro area through the other side of of what it's going through right now. What is that they say? If you're going through hell, just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, and you you brought up a great point, you know, um there's a lot of, there was so much innovation to be had. And I think that's why it's important to create this podcast episode of this, this podcast program in particular is to show the innovation that we have, not only in the Portland metro area, but, you know, around the, around the United States, but primarily within that Pacific Northwest location, because it's really important to understand that iron sharpens iron. Uh, America's economy was built on the back of these small businesses and there's a lot of great thoughts and ideas out there that need to be shared. And even though that the pandemic was um, difficult, right, a lot of people closed their doors, a lot of these businesses were still open, right? They they pivoted uh, they pivoted strategies and went, you know, to the virtual world. Um, they had different medians of trying to uh, uh, really kind of connect with their with their customers and engage with their customers. And so it's just trying to figure out different ways, but. Honestly, you know, Amanda, to your point, I've never felt more engaged the last like year and a half with our community than I've ever had before, because I think there's so many people and there's so many cool things like you mentioned with Stephen Green and Juan Barraza, um, you know, Juntos PDX with Christian Vargas, all of these cool programs that are starting to come out because of the pandemic, right? Because I think what happened is a lot of people, it exacerbated a lot of these needs that were unmet. and a lot of the people that you mentioned, they truly have stepped up and said, we are going to figure out a way to meet those needs because that's what our community deserves. That's what crucible moments do. They pull people together, people pitch in, they double down, they really get connected to each other when they're, when they're in it deep together. So, you know, by the time this airs, maybe we'll feel like there's a lot of light on the horizon and and that we will have come through, you know, another dark winter. <laughs> 
And I don't mean to overstate it because living in Portland, you don't feel it at all. In my neighborhood, you know, I feel the the sun comes out and the park is across the street and life feels good. I don't feel threatened. I don't feel nervous or unsafe or unstable in any way. And Idea Ship's office is downtown and I come down here every day and I've never had a problem downtown, but I know that, that, that you know, it's intense in a lot of pockets, yeah. um, both downtown and out on the fringes. So it it's there. It's, it's, it's something we need to pull together and work together to get through. And with that kind of commitment, there's no doubt we will. It just takes, yeah, getting our, getting our sleeves rolled up and digging in. I agree. And, you know, for the folks that are listening that may have not come up to the Portland metro area recently, um, I, I would encourage you to, I really would encourage you because a lot of these small businesses do want your support and it is very safe. I take my daughter down to old Chinatown. Often we go, you know, dead stack coffee. We go down that location um, quite often. And I would encourage you to really come up to the community, check it out. We are, it's really is safe. Certainly we have our pockets just like large other metropolitan locations do. But Portland is still beautiful. We're still the Rose City. We still have the riverfront. We still have amazing human beings walking our town every day. You can go to scooter or bike, go to some coffee or wine, whatever you want to do. It, it's it's a beautiful spot. All I would do is just encourage you to, as opposed to you know sharing the means of what you may have seen that happened probably three years ago, uh, come up and see what's happening today because it, it is definitely a world of difference. And and we are working our butts off uh, to make sure it's. Uh, it, it is truly welcoming to everyone. And so again, everybody listening, I encourage you guys, please to come up to Portland, please. And not only Portland, but all of, all of our cities throughout the entire state of Oregon to really come show support for those entrepreneurs really kind of doing what they can. Now, Amanda, what would you, what, what should we be looking forward to as in, individuals for the next future? What are some of the products are, I'm not sure if you're able to speak on this, but if you are, <laughs> what are some of the things that are in the pipeline um, for, with, with your team that you guys are funding that maybe we should be kind of looking out for? Yeah, you know, I am absolutely fascinated by the level of innovation that's going on in the climate and clean tech space. Everything from, you know, different kinds of renewable energy, energy storage, recycling, battery, even smokestack industries that have already, you know, they've projected out oil and gas and smokestack in industries that have projected out their forecasts. They know that the world is changing. They are completely cognizant that their business models need to change. And there's a, a really dramatic level of innovation and effort going into coming up with um, not just the big solutions that are going to sort of, you know, make the headlines and be obvious sort of news stories, but all the component parts of, you know, if if you're innovating some part of a much bigger supply chain and cleaning up or re-energizing or creating a closed loop system, um, sort of circular economy style for some component of a bigger supply chain, there's innovation happening at every single level um, particularly, particularly in energy, but also in recycling and renewables. It's fascinating. I'm learning so much. Yep. In fact, those innovators out there, if somebody can figure out a way to either a carbon negative furniture, that's what I want to see. I want to see, I, I, I can't create it. I, this is my idea. I'm sharing it with you guys. Somebody out there, create furniture I can put in my house that actually removes, helps remove carbon from the air. <laughs> figure out a way to do that right <laughs> figure out what to do. there you go somebody grab that idea <laughs> amanda thank you so much now for the folks listening at home how can they actually connect with you how can they find out more about you if they want to connect with you either on linkedin or a website maybe they want to find out more about idea ship fund how can they uh, do that yep i'm on all the socials as a o born so a o b o r n e that's linkedin and facebook and insta and all the things um, Idea Ship Fund's website is ideashipfund.com, um, and that there's a pretty good explanation on there about how the model works. And there's also an intake form for founders. So if founders are would like to have a you know 30 minute screener meeting and and see if Idea Ship can be helpful to them, the place to do that is to start is to start by filling out that that form. 
We are on Twitter for as long as Twitter lasts at Idea Ship Fund. <laughs> um, and, and I'm really happy, you know, I feel like a very uh, committed and active member of the local uh, entrepreneurial community. So I go to the OEN events, I go to a lot of the other uh, events in town. So feel free to grab me if we see each other at one of those. Um, and yeah, or, or get in touch directly. And I'm happy to take a meeting and bounce off some ideas and give you some thoughts about, you know, whether there's a patent journey in your future <laughs> as a founder. So yeah, hit me up. Yes. And I, I can tell you folks, she's very approachable. I, I legit walk straight up to him. Like you were on my list of people to talk to when I went to <laughs> Latin, the pitch Latino. I was like, oh. we got to connect <laughs> the legend herself, Amanda Oborn. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your experience and your knowledge uh, phenomenal work that you're doing in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Continue doing everything you're doing. Really do appreciate uh, seeing, sitting on the sidelines, watching your work, because um, even though I, I think there's a lot that you do in the community that people just don't see, I'm here to tell you that I'm seeing it and I think it's amazing. So congratulations on all of your work uh, for idea uh, ship amazing stuff. I'm really excited to see what you guys have down the pipeline. Uh, you guys are already coming out with some great stuff. So again, so folks listening at home, please visit the shades of e.com to subscribe to the newsletter. You'll have information about idea ship on the newsletter the week before the episode airs the week, the episode airs and the week after you can also find a transcription of this conversation at the shades of e.com. Just go ahead and under the podcast section, you go ahead and find Amanda's name and you will have the transcription and you can also listen to it there as well. So you can go and follow along. It's kind of like a sing along. And then you can also follow me on all of these social sites, except I recently retired the Twitter. So I am on the TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. But other than that, thank you and have a great night.